Hi everybody, I'm Brad Williams here and over there is Ali Akbarium. Uh, today we are doing something a little bit different. Today to kick off the new year, I'm actually going to interview Ali and his position as a mobility expert. He's an engineer and he's also a modifier of vehicles. And today I'm going to interview him about his role. Ali, are you ready to get questioned? I'm ready and I'm excited. All right, let's get into it. Driving is something many take for granted, but when someone has altered ability, then driving or getting out and about in your own car can be challenging. Driving with a disability doesn't mean you have to drive an old clapped out car with farm-like machinery and relying on a wheelchair doesn't mean waiting for hours and then being in the back of a maxi access cab getting car sick. The Drivable podcast is designed to introduce and explore driving aids for people with disabilities, vehicle modifications, the NDIS, research, medical guidelines, driving techniques and much much more. The Drivable Podcast is to help you be informed and be in control of your own independence so you can experience freedom through driving safely and reliably. I'm Ali and with me is Brad and together we have over 30 years of experience in disability and driving. Enough of the intros, let's get into it. G'day everybody, I'm really excited to get this uh, interview underway today because like we said, it's a little bit unique. We're going to interview each other over the next couple of episodes. So Ali, I hope you're ready to have a whole lot of questions fired at you. But before we do that, we do need to do a shout out to our sponsors who make this show possible and they are Mobility Engineering and Williams OT. This show takes a lot of time and money to put together and we're forever grateful for their passion for our industry. All right, that's enough of the business. So let's get into this interview. Ali, thanks very much for putting your hand up to be interviewed. Can we get started? Just like we ask every participant who gets interviewed on this podcast, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this position? Yeah, okay, so, um, uh, well, first off, thanks very much. And um, yeah, it's really cool to be on the uh, interviewee side. On the receiving um, end. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, and um, I've given an intro and uh, we both, both you and I have uh, in episode one. So whilst it's a rusty one, go back and check it out um, to get more of the depth. But the uh, what we're going to do today is focus more on the modifier and engineer part. So I'll talk a little bit more about that angle, I guess. Um, and... I've got working with Mobility Engineering as a family company. My dad was an engineer um, in my cultural background being um, in Iran, Middle East, you basically had as growing up three choices for a career, engineer, doctor, or lawyer. And since my dad was an engineer, I pretty much was like, all right, well, fine, I'll be an engineer. And then a few years later, he's like, well, you're an engineer now, you can come work for your dad. And I was like, okay, I'll come work for my dad. And then one thing led to another and I was doing engineering and and I guess um, through my own personal passions and pushing various agendas in the industry, I ended up focusing a lot um, over a 10, 15 year period um, into the disability side of things. And now, um, particularly in Sydney, I'm pretty much the go-to person for all engineering around disability modifications um, to the point where um, even the government inspectors have been known to call me in the middle of a job going, hey, Ali, what do I do about this? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and it's because also to segue to the next part, the majority of that is not because I'm a great engineer or anything. It's just because I work within the industry as a modifier and run a company that's a modification company and an importer of products. And because I have so much experience about the products and the engineering, the authorities uh, like to lean on my advice for that purpose. So it's not because I'm great at engineering, it's more because I know about the products. And as we've said multiple times in a lot of the um, uh, interviews here, the more you know about the product, the better you can be at the job. Yeah. So look, guys, everybody listening to this, you've got an expert here that I'm going to pound with questions. Uh, if you've got more questions, make sure that you put them up on uh, the Facebook page or email, email them through to us. Uh, you can just search for Drive-Able Podcast on Facebook if you want to ask more questions, and I'm sure Ali will uh, respond to those if they come through. So the first question I've got to you is, 
why is the role of the engineer so important when it comes to vehicle modifications? In your background there, you've got a turnout seat. Um, so if we concentrate on some of the modifications to get people in and out of cars and driving controls, why is an engineer so important, Ellie? So it's, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, the engineer is probably one of the most important people in the, um, the, the journey. However, they're probably one of the most forgotten and neglected people in the whole journey as well. And I think the reason why, and this is also why it's important, is because all we're thinking about and all we're talking about is unfortunately negativity. And mm. we're talking about what's going to happen when you have a crash. What's going to happen when you have a crash? What's going to happen when you have a crash? And that's all we're thinking about. And that's all we're talking about. And people don't like to talk about that stuff. And they don't like to consider all of that stuff. It's a negative subject. And so, um, and so it can be a bit of a touchy subject for people to talk about. But that's effectively the long and short of it. That's what we're looking at is one, when you change a product. So to explain it to people, you, you guys, have, most people have seen videos, you know, here and there through various forms of media of a crash test, a car banging into a wall and smashing and, you know, and slow motion pictures and things like that. That's all normally done by the manufacturer of the company, like a Volkswagen or a Toyota or whatever. They prove that to the government that, hey, my seats, my everything in my car is going to be safe. Here's the crash test to prove it. Then once you go and take that thing out of the car and you put something else in there, well, then the, the, that crash testing is no longer valid you know it's mm. like what's going to happen now in a crash and then um and as i said sometimes we talk about the negativity because those are the questions that's the angle that we're looking at is okay you've put that seed in there now um yes there's things like does it fit comfortably is it dimensionally correct and can you actually get into it and out of it those are important aspects for usability but the most important aspect is now if i have a crash what's going to happen to this installation. And that's what we are trained to do is look at it from that angle. And, and there's a couple of angles to that as well, but that's yeah. mainly what it is. So we've uh, consulted with Amin before, who's um, works in the parts of the uh, regulations. I, I'm yep. assuming as an engineer, you've got a whole lot of regulations to meet and, and work by. Yeah, so basically, it's sort of like a two pronged approach with the engineering. Um, so the regulations, what they're there for is to guide you as to give, give a bit of a guideline as to if you follow these regulations, you're pretty much guaranteed to be safe as a minimum level, right? So they're, they're effectively like some kind of guideline, but they are, but they're a regulation and they're in law. And so whilst they're a guideline, we still have to meet them as a minimum requirement, like as per legislation, as per the country that we live in. Um, so, so, and and where it can be a bit confusing and where those two kind of prongs, are, then the other prong is basically just looking at it and assessing it from a engineering point of view of, of doing calculations and strength and steel and, you know, bits of steel that are strong enough and bolts that are big enough and using your knowledge through those like around the forces and how they react Basically, is this going to be safe enough in that event of an accident? And then there's also additional quirks from the regulations, which help you to make it safe, but also other things like accessibility, you know, uh, fire protection, many, many things, environmental protections, all these little things, right? Now, the government is, like, we live in a country which is, you know, a governed country that's um, a very good country because of that. And you have to meet the requirements of these rules in order for these vehicles to be basically back onto the road. So once you take the car off the road um, and you remove a seat, let's say we're talking about that turning seat in the background and you put a new seat, that new seat is not certified with that car because the car's certified seat has been taken out. So now the car is uncertified. It needs a certification. So, and the system we have in Australia is that the engineer, a third party engineer like myself can provide that assessment and that certification and we have a guideline to demonstrate to the government that hey we have done the right thing and the government wants to the government and and it's not to say that they're bad but the government and the lawyers and everything like that they look at it from a paperwork point of view we look at it from both a paperwork and a um, physical point of view so the government wants to make sure the paperwork's in check mm -hmm. and 
the installer and, and the person that's working with the installer wants to make sure the physical side in, is in check and the engineer is bringing all of those together and making sure that, I guess, bringing that all together as a bridge and making sure everybody understands that everyone's on the same page mm -hmm. and everything's going to be safe and compliant. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. And it's, and it's getting, you know, you could get really technical in this interview and it'll go way above my head, but we want to just keep it to a, so people understand the process. I guess from my point of view, the way I explain it to people is if, if you are involved in an accident, we don't, we need to know whether the car was at fault and whether that's going to uh, meet your needs as a, as a person in the car, whether it's going to keep you as safe as possible to the minimum standard and hopefully beyond that. Is that, have I got it right there? Yeah. And in addition to that, there's, so in particularly in the culture that we have in Australia, um, we basically have a very strong, and it works very well, a very strong trust-based culture, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, um, if I go to, mobility engineering mm -hmm. and they advertise themselves as a reputable modifying company i'm basically as a user of uh, as a community member going to put my trust that this thing is going to be safe i don't really need to I, in general in australia i don't think to myself oh is this going to be unsafe what am i going to do in an accident i'm mm -hmm. basically thinking mobility engineering professional company the Australian government's um, looking at looking out after them. So I'm going to be okay. I'm not really going to question these things, right? Now, unfortunately, that trust is not always um, treated the best way by the other person. So mm -hmm. uh, particularly when you have vulnerable people mm -hmm. um, and particularly when you have an industry that's been left untouched. So what you've got now, and this is causing a little bit of, I guess, tension within the industry, and that's why engineers are all of a sudden a bit of a celebrity, um, negative or positive, uh, even though we didn't necessarily want to be, um, is that basically in the past, before NDIS, you might have had like 10 cars converted on in the whole country, you know, 15 cars in the whole country. Now, just one modifier I, I know is doing about two to 300 a year, right? Mm -hmm. And that they used to do maybe two or three a year, right? So mm -hmm. now... You've got five, six, seven hundred cars coming onto the road every year instead of ten to twenty. Now the government wants to know what's going on because now you're having a now you're having a very, very serious impact on the rest of the community. And as yeah. we've interviewed others in our own podcast, people have crashes and people have had crashes, and the community has trust in the system. And now the community is going, well, we've got trust in the system. Why is this happening? And why are we at risk? And the reason why is because it was a tiny little area of the industry that was never really paid attention to. And now the government is going, well, okay, the risk is increasing. Now we're paying attention. And now we're finding where the mistrust is, I guess. And now it's coming a little bit more to light. And it's not people's fault, but let's say, for example, the government is now asking a lot more questions about these tourney seats. So in the past, I could have installed the tourney seat. I could have installed, let's say, 20 of them. And nobody ever asked me questions. The engineer goes, oh, yeah, that looks pretty good. Government goes, oh, yeah, that looks pretty good. And it all goes through. Now, I do that three, four years down the track. I've done 10 of them, 20 of them. Suddenly, if a government guy comes and says to me, hey, Ali, you haven't done this right, I'm going to instantly get my back up and go, what do you mean? I've been doing this for years. Mm -hmm. You're wrong. No, I'm doing it right. But that's unfortunately where the problem is arising. People have been doing it for years incorrectly, unknowingly, um, and they're not bad mm. people. They just thought they were doing the right thing. And I guess we're now coming in a lot more because we're being much more involved and flagging these things and becoming a bit of a celebrity and going, well, no, this is not 100% right. Uh, and I'll give you one very quick example on that. And this is a very important thing that I find in the industry. And I think it also happens not just in automotive, in other parts of the industry. Mm -hmm. um, so Australians actually tend to sell themselves and Australia a little bit short when it comes to quality of products and quality of standards, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I can verify for you that Australian standards and regulations are the toughest in the world, much tougher than anywhere else in the world. And also the quality of the products that are from here are probably the best in the world because we've got those tough standards. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I have a little bit of a bee in my bonnet about and I get, uh, I get uh, frustrated about is people say, you know, I got this product from Europe, you know, 
I got this product, let's say from Germany, look at German cars. They're the most advanced cars in the world. And so this product must be the best, you know, I'm not even going to question it. How do you question it? Because it's German, you know, Mm -hmm. I've seen some really, really crappy products out of Germany, you know, Mm -hmm. really, really bad products out of Germany. It's got nothing to do with the country. It's just got to do with the company that's making it. But then we've got this misconception, same with, um, same with um, America. You know, uh, oh, the stuff comes out of the States. You know, they've got such a big suing culture and everything must be safe and they must be, you know, look at look at their technology. They invented the iPhones. They must be better than us. But it's actually not true. We're actually the best out of all of these countries, you know, And um, but we're selling ourselves short, thinking all of these other countries are better. But these products come in and they're not good enough. They need more testing. They need some mm. upgrades, you know, and we don't like to hear that for some reason. Yeah, well, as you can see, people, uh, Ali gets really passionate about his uh, pet subject here of engineering. I've got a um, question about what type of things do you commonly see in the disability field that ne- well that you see for engineering? Um, there's hand control, seats, other things as well. What what type of things are the things that you would commonly assess for as an engineer? So when you assess, um, you assess, as I said, two prongs. The first prong, generally speaking, for me personally, um, and I think most engineers work the same way, gets fairly easy over time. It's the physical inspection, right? Mm -hmm. The physical inspection and making sure you, the product has been installed as it's been designed to be installed as per the manufacturer's instructions and so on. Mm -hmm. So as an engineer, good practice, which is what I do, and I actually advise a lot of other engineers to do, is develop relationships with products and clients. So you become really good at it. And so you can easily pick things out, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, for example, uh, on Friday afternoon, I inspected a, um, a particular product. It was, it was not a disability product. It was actually a side-folding seat in the back of a van. And I've inspected this so many times that... At the corner of my eye, I saw that there was a bolt not correctly connected into the plate. And because I've seen this so many times and I've seen this product so many times, I could instantly see something was wrong without even, like it it automatically appeared into my brain because I've seen it so many times. It was like, Mm -hmm. no, this is not what you've normally said. And then my eyes went over and focused on a little bit more. And and this is what I uh, advise a lot of other people and engineers, develop those relationships with the engineers. So then they get to know how you operate as a person, how you operate as a product. It just makes it a lot easier and and they can then the physical inspection part becomes easier to manage and understand that it's been done correctly. Mm-hmm. So then then there's the compliance part to make sure that let's say, for example, using hand control, I've come and looked at it, it's been installed all as per those instructions, I've verified the instructions, all good. Then I've got to look at the um, compliance documentation around it to make sure that it meets the compliance requirements. Now, where this This is actually where it falls apart a little bit in Australia. And going back to what I said about things coming from Europe and America, we have much tighter standards that stuff from stuff that uh, compared to the the stuff that's being, I guess, certified overseas. So, but there is this kind of an assumption, like I've been given, for example, um, from a customer, hey, here's a test report from America for this hand control. So, you know, it's okay. And it's from America, so it must mean it's okay. So I'll read the test report and then I'll go, yeah, the test report is okay for 50% of the requirements, but there's another 50% of the requirements that this test test report is not meeting. And then that's when you can get a bit of frustration from the end user or the modifier or whoever going, but I've installed it, just pass it, you know, what what's all that stuff? It doesn't really matter. The Americans are okay with it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I said it going back to like being the standards being different, it's it could be like a test or a vibrate. Like, for example, we've got a test here for hand controls that no other country has in the world. Um, And it's a shake test, right? So you basically have to shake hand controls. I think it's like four or 500 shakes. I can't remember off the top of my head. And the idea is because in Australia, we have so many dirt roads and bumpy roads. um, These hand controls shouldn't fall apart in these dirt roads and bumpy Mm. roads. And like when we spoke to Nick, if you remember, he was saying that it has happened where hand controls have fallen apart, you know, so Mm -hmm. from blue bags, the insurance guys. So, so the point is, is that test is not done anywhere else in the world. So if you just assume, yeah, this is fine because it's from America. Well, there's one very important safety aspect, which is actually a legitimate one because of our roads in Australia, that's not being addressed, Mm. you know? Um, And, and so that's where our job comes in and becomes really important. And, um, and even to be honest, as a supplier of products and a modifier, 
um, it's come back to me as well, where we've had engineers come and say, you haven't done this part or this part is missing from the standard. And then lucky for me, I'm an engineer. I can go get that part sorted. But but yeah, that's that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, we've got to try and keep Ali under 20 minutes here for this podcast. He's, he, <laughs> we're, we're, I've got to try and keep him on track here. I've got another question though, um, in regards to those more significant modifications. So when the car actually gets cut to pieces and then put back together, maybe for a lowered floor, wheelchair conversion yep. that must that must be a big job for you yeah so those jobs are the biggest um they take the longest and have the most amount of analysis i actually to be honest um prefer those jobs um they are they are the easiest they are the so so when you're constructing a vehicle and you're using big, big pieces of steel and big sheet metal and things like that from a certification point of view, it's actually easier to assess um, than if you're using like, let's say that tourney seat in the background, that's quite a complex bit of engineering. Mm -hmm. So it's it's actually a lot harder to assess that than if you cut the floor of the vehicle out. Yeah, right. um, so so yeah, it's, but the thing is, is that that company that makes that product is generally a multi-million dollar international company that's done all the high level assessments. And I just have to verify that. Whereas the, the guy that does the cutting of the floor um, we have to do the assessments. So what that means is we also then have to test the cars. We have to do stability tests. We have to drive the cars onto tracks um, and we've got to do all of that stuff. Now, generally speaking, you do that for the first car. And then after that, it's sort of, you can certify all the other cars as long as they've been certified the same, as that long same as they've been way, built the right? same way. Yeah. And, and like I've said before, but look, as long as it's been certified, it is, it is safe, but generally we, try and lean towards not cutting you know sections of the car out because it, it like i said this car in the background has had thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of um crash testing done to it mm -hmm. so the uh, amount as long as we can honor that as much as possible we're going to be in a safer position yeah i mean if you're cutting into a major uh, crossbar a stabilization crossbar across the across the van or across the the car then that the car needs to be able to be stable to go around corners and exactly and, and that's one of the one of the very important tests that you have to do is um is a stability test so they call it traditionally the lane change test and you effectively have to just you know well get a professional driver because it's a pretty um you know scary test and you drive it and effectively trying to get the car to get unstable and see how stable it is after this modification you know mm -hmm. and um and yeah, like if you're feeling that it's unstable, um, it may need a bit more work done to it. And, and it's actually not that hard to do. It's just, uh, yeah, just yeah. getting the right bits and pieces. Yeah. All right. So, Ali, you wear two hats. I don't, look, people, if you've got questions about the engineering process, make sure that you put comments down below or go to the Facebook page, Drive Able Podcast, and put in your questions there when... Um, under this show or send us through uh, direct questions and we'll get back to you. There's probably a whole lot more that we can unpack in regards to engineering, but Ali, you wear two hats. Your other one is, is an actual modifier. So yeah. actually doing the cars and actually yeah. uh, putting components into the car. Now, as an engineer, I'm assuming that that job's a little bit easier, but can you unpack the actual, um, modifying part of it all for our listeners and where that fits into the whole process. Yep. Um, quick shameless plug before I do, please send me the questions because uh, I'll do a QA and a video on them. And I've got like <laughs> 167 of those videos. So as you can tell uh, so far by this interview, I love to talk about this topic and there's hundreds of hours of uh, videos on YouTube that prove that. Um, okay. So as a modifier, so yeah, as you said, we also have a modification business where we install the products into the um, various products, ones that we are importing or ones from others into the vehicles. Um, as the modifier, you have, again, a fairly unique role. And um, what your role is, is, is probably one of the more important roles, I think, um, because you're kind of having to make, you're, you're the last, last person that the... Um, person is interacting with i guess before they they drive the vehicle mm -hmm. um and it, it can be challenging as a modifier because you can often feel like you're in the dark because as as we've spoken about before um you can have people up to 12 two years of, of preparing driving tests assessments all that before they get modified 
And then you're two years down the track and you knock on the door of the modifier and go, hey, I need hand control for this. And they're going, what? What do you mean? What is that? What's all this about? And and so um, it can be a little bit confusing sometimes for the modifier. So I guess having more, more and more in information and context for the modifier helps them to make an assessment. A side note is on that modifiers are modifying the vehicles. And in fact, it's quite interesting because... Um, Modifiers, I find, are the, the biggest experts on the actual products of the mm. vehicle. And what I've realized, even from our own factory, um, the guys that are converting the cars, the guys that are actually installing, like, you know, your quote unquote workshop guy, um, they are now also our handover customer service guys because they know the products better than anybody mm. because they pull it apart and put them in, you know? And so, so they're the, the true experts on the products is the guys that install it. So it's great when we can get them to communicate with the OTs and the, um, the end users, because I find that most of the stress has then gone away because they're like, Oh, I don't know how to use this. And I don't know how to do that. And does this work? And the guy who's installed it goes, yeah, just like this, this and this and no problems. And I've installed mm. it, you know? Yep. So, so that um, having that communication is probably the key for removing any issues or, 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 or having issues because you're kind of the middle of the engineer. You've got to make sure the engineer is happy. You've got to make sure the OT is happy. This thing actually works and it fits in the car, you know? So, um, so yeah, that's, that, that's where you sit as the modifier. Well, I, I really want to touch on that point as an OT myself. Uh, we value the modifiers expert opinion on the, on the actual modification. So as an OT, and uh, I believe you're going to interview me next week and we can talk about what the OT role does in more detail. But what um, we, we assess the function of the client in a really short amount of time here. And then we ask the modifier for the right aid. We might have an idea of what, what, the, right, what the right aid is, but then we have to double check that with the modifier right at the beginning stages or as early as possible that this is going to work it's no good that it's uh we train somebody in how to use this modification and then it doesn't fit in the car or it doesn't meet engineering the modifier from where i sit uh, is crucial in making sure that all of the standards are going to be met it's going to fit in the car and that it's going to be a quality product that the person can use for many years to come so um yeah. Yeah, they're they're a vital vital cog in the in the in the wheel. And a little a little tip or hack, which I'll just highlight what I said before um, for people out there. Um, talk to the guys that are working on the floor. Try and get in contact with them. It's sometimes harder with the companies, but if you can, um, so for example, all the companies will have workshop guys, but they'll also have you know like a service tech or whatever. Um, so, but they also, a lot of the companies also have like a sales rep, right? Mm -hmm. The sales rep is like, they're, they're good, but the person that installs the product, nobody knows the product like they do, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're getting a little bit of like, I guess my hack or my tip to you as an as a end user or client or, a, or an OT is if you're asking the sales rep some questions and you're not getting full confidence, maybe try and weasel the number of the modifier out, the, the workshop guy out and say, hey, look, I've heard that, the guys in the workshop have probably thought it know what they're doing. Um, I've done it before. Maybe I can talk to them, you know, and, and you'll find, first of all, just knowing the industry, it'll make them, it'll make their day. Um, if you rang the workshop guy and said, Hey, um, can you help me out with this? Um, you'll, you'll make them feel like the best person in the world because they love doing what they do and they love to help out. Um, but they're, and they're often forgotten in that, in that workshop, but they know more than anybody else. Um, yeah. And so that's my little tip is get in contact with those guys or the guys that do the repairs no one knows more than they do about how the product works. Yeah, I have to 100% back you up on that. Some companies do have a salesperson and they're, they're about, I don't know, some companies I'm assuming would have them working on commission and it's more about trying to get a sale than it is about getting the right product. Then you can, you can actually pick them a mile away. Uh, yeah. Some of those companies that are all sales-based um, and you got to make sure that for the client, the end user, that it is the best product for meeting the entire need, not just um, getting a sale. And, and that makes a massive difference. And also the, the, the modifier, I actually would trust um, 
over the engineer from a compatibility point of view. Honestly, even like going back to my engineer hat, often modifiers ring me and go, hey, Ali, what do I do with this? And my common feedback to them is, you're the one fitting this stuff. You've been doing it for 20 years. Like you're way better than me. You would know more than I would. So why don't you tell me how you're going to do it? And I can just check the rules and verify if it's okay. And we'll probably find it is okay. You know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the, the modifiers and the guys particularly that are getting their hands dirty, they, they know the most, you know, they're, they're, as I said, they're getting their hands dirty. So don't, don't sell that short in terms of that knowledge. And on that note, um, one of the, I guess, parts which cause a lot of issues for, for both the modifiers and the clients is not getting the modifier to verify the installation into your vehicle before you've actually purchased the product or finally committed to it. Now, if, if someone is telling you, I can fit this product into your car and they've never seen your car in person and they've never fitted one into your particular car, I would be very, very skeptical of that. And I'd want the modifier and the workshop guys to give a look at my car and maybe measure it up. Um, and it might mean an extra couple of trips, but I've seen so many times and I've even had you, Brad, call me on a couple of times where someone's not done that process properly and then they've installed like a swivel seat or something and it just doesn't work. And it's like, it doesn't come out or it's not actually functioning. And it's like, well, they just had to, and the most common one is, They'll go to the modifier, oh, I want to buy this car, and they measure it up and they go, no, it's not going to fit. And then um, they'll go and buy it anyway and then go, well, make it fit, you know, yeah, or I'll find right. someone else. You know? yeah. And then they might find someone else that'll make it fit, but it just doesn't work. You know? so, and it doesn't meet engineering. Fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that is the big thing. And you're such a, a, a key link between the engineering and the, and the OT and or a client. And, and you've got to... I think the modifiers have the hardest job out of the whole cog because they are that middle person. The OT is the middle person between the client and the modifier quite often. Sometimes uh, they're, they're not part of that process and the client goes straight to the modifier if they're not going through NDIS or, or looking for funding or an assessment um, and they can go straight to the modifier. And then the modifier is that key link between, well, one, putting it in, but also that link between the safety standards as well and the client and making sure that it is going to be a safe vehicle to drive. And also, um, again, just a little bit of a like love for the modifiers. Um, it's it, they, they have the hardest time, as I said, because what happens is they haven't been part of this journey leading up to the product. They're sort of there at the end, but then the OT goes away and they're there handing over the product to mm -hmm. the person. So they've got a really difficult job. Often, I mean, I know you're a pretty good OT, uh, Brad, and you're often there at the handover, but but a lot of OTs aren't, right? And mm. and so we'll see, we'll just have a client turn up and we're starting to hand this over and they're like, but that's not what I needed and that's not what I did. And, and we're kind of like, but I told my OT this and, you know, they were there and we, we trialed this and we're kind of like, oh, but we, and we're trying to, create that context and understand that story because we didn't realize that story, you know, and, mm. and we've sort of said, but, but it fits and it, and it works and, and, but that's not what I wanted. And, and so, right. so I guess um, understanding that and, and trying to give a little bit more love to the modifiers by information and journey and context, particularly if you're not going to be there at the end, will really help smooth and think things out because you know what happens in those situations? What does the modifier do? Who's the first person they slag off? that bloody OT, it's all the OT's fault, you know? And then and then the OT goes and slags off the, the modifier. Oh, they, they screwed you over. And, you know, so, and it doesn't, it doesn't, and who loses? The client, right? So, yeah. So, um, so, so yeah, if there's a little bit of communication there, you won't have that kind of tension, I think. All right. And that's what this podcast is all about, people. Uh, next week, uh, Ali gets to fire questions at me um, and ask me about it, uh, about my process as an OT and also as a driving instructor as well, uh, whether it's to do with modifications or like in my background, Bruno, who's got, uh, was just recently interviewed and talks about his uh, autism uh, process that he went through to get his license. Um, Ali can fire questions at me and, and I'll give my tips about how best to make that work from my experience um, with, over, with over 13 years in the, in the industry. Uh, as, a, as an OT doing this full time. So um, 
this podcast is all about trying to open up the pathway so people can understand and we're talking from experience and Ali's got lots of experience working with OTs, not just myself, uh, but other OTs along the way. So uh, he talks from experience when we uh, talk about that, but we'll, we'll certainly give tips on how to work better. And that's what I want to say now is thank you very much, Ali, for your, for your time today and being so off, uh, honest. But like we always do in every episode, we want to, you to stick around because we're going to highlight our top three takeaways from this interview. And we're just going to uh, break down. There was so much information. What we're going to do is we're going to break down the top three elements when we come back after this break. But to start off with a huge thank you for your time and, and effort today, Ali. Thank you very much, Brad. All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, this section we bring to you is all about our expert analysis and our top three takeaways from the interview that we've just done. This one was a bit unique where it's me interviewing Ali, uh, but together we bring together our 30 years of joint experience in the industry. So uh, this is where Ali and I pull apart and get into the nitty gritties a little bit more about what we've just uh, spoken about. Um, in this one, Ali's already gone into lots and lots of detail already. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep it a little bit shorter in this uh, top three takeaways and just highlight what we've just spoken about already. The first top takeaway that we're going to talk about is highlighting that role of the engineer again, and, and who better to do that is uh, Ali. Ali, can you just really quickly highlight what the engineer's role is? Yeah, so as we said, uh, initially what the engineer does is to verify, there's, there's two prongs. There's the compliance side of it. So verify that the product is compliant with all the required Australian standards and regulations and rules and basically a paperwork check. Mm -hmm. um, and then also to verify, which is paperwork and physical, that the product has been installed correctly as per the instructions of the manufacturer. Now, just to clarify on what that means, it's a physical inspection, but also an interview with an installer. That's, mm -hmm. that's part of the, the job. Yeah. And that's that, that's that final tick of approval that this modification meets the requirements to drive on Australian roads. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So number two takeaway then is to highlight what the modifier does. So Ali, again, snapshot for us. What is the role of the modifier? So the modifier um, is basically the person that is presented with a product or has recommended a product. And then the OT has verified the product and then they've come back and they are checking to make sure that the product fits in the vehicle and will work in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And they've also checked to make sure that installation that they propose to do is compliant in accordance with what the engineer's compliance requirements are. And I'm just going to highlight on this point as well, um, being an OT, and you highlighted it in your talk as well, is that a high quality modifier will not just be a salesperson, they will be somebody that actually measures the car to make sure it fits and possibly check with an engineer right at the start to make sure that this product is actually going to meet the end use, the end, the end need. And uh, we'll do it from a, a functional point of view, uh, not just a let's sell a product point of view. Yeah, yeah. So as we said, if the person is saying, if they haven't installed the product before into that particular exact car and they're telling you, yeah, yeah, no problems, we can definitely do it. And they haven't, you haven't seen a measuring tape in their hand or anything like that. Um, Thank you. I'd be questioning yeah. it. But what I wanted to ref I just remind everybody of is that little tip. It's not that the company is a bad company. It's just could be a salesperson. So maybe maybe get on to uh, get in touch with someone more technical in their company to get that final technical verification if you're unsure. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. And the third takeaway is how does it all fit together? So I'm going to I'm going to be interviewed next week. So make sure that you tune in for that one in regards to the driving instruction and OT role. And I'll I'm sure I'll be questioned on all the nitty gritties in regards to what is the OT role. 
Um, but it's important to highlight it here in regards to how does it all fit together, the engineer's role, the modifier's role, and then how does that work with the client and the OT? So Ali, do you wanna, do you wanna bring this together for us? Yeah, yeah, so as we were just discussing before, and I've spoken to a few um, OTs about this and modifiers, and I was mentioning that. So the from what we've seen and what we uh, have agreed on, the OT is working with the client. They're, 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 and and the, the, per, the engineer is working with the rules and regulations and the um, modifier is working with the product into the vehicle. Now, what all these three people, they actually, they're dealing with a different product, but they're actually speaking almost the exact same language. And in fact, particularly with OTs and engineers and workshop guys, uh, and girls, they're very technical in the way they talk. They just talk about a different product, but they're generally very technical. And if you can actually bring that all together and start to understand that, the relationship um, gets really, really easy. And um, and yeah, very technical and, and so on and so forth. So, so yeah, I, what I find is if we bring it together that way, the car, the, the, the regulation and the person, and everyone's working together in that community for the end user in the middle, um, then you've got a really, really good um, outcome. Yeah, so just to bring that, uh, highlight that again, the OT is about assessing the person, the modifier is about assessing the car and making sure that it fits in the car and then making that happen. And then the engineer is a regulatory check off to make sure that all of that's been done correctly. Yeah, so exactly. that, that's how it all fits. Um, the modifier is the middle person between the OT slash client and the engineer. And then the OT is the, the middle person between the client and the modifier um, to, to help those come together. So I hope that's been really useful, everybody. That's That winds up our, our interview today. Um, but as we wind up, we wanna do another shout out to our sponsors, Mobility Engineering and Williams OT for helping us bring you this episode today. Uh, Williams OT, a driver assessment and rehab. Uh, brings together all the pieces of the puzzle to assist people with disabilities reach their driving and community mobility goals. And Mobility Engineering is a team of passionate and dedicated people focused on bringing Australia's largest range of uh, suitable transport solutions for all walks of life. If you've got any questions uh, or if you know somebody that would like to be interviewed or you'd like us to interview somebody, um, make sure that you email us. It's a pretty simple email address, driveablepodcast at gmail.com, or make sure that you hit us up on the Facebook page, drive-able underscore podcast is what you need to search for. You can just put in driveable podcast and it'll, it'll take you to all of our show notes. Um, and Ali, a huge thanks to you today for being so honest and open and uh, I'm going to hand it over to you to do the sign-off. Thanks very much, Brad. And yeah, thank you for asking the questions. And uh, thank you to the listeners to, for the listeners to tolerating my uh, extreme passion on these subjects. <laughs> and uh, as we always say in every episode, the advice provided in this podcast is general na of nature. So if you have any queries about what you can do and what will work for you, uh, get in contact with your local OT or mobility, uh, mobility dealer and set yourself up with a trial. Trials really do put you in the driver's seat. So we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Thanks for listening to the Drive Able podcast with Brad Williams and Ali Akbarian. If you like what you've heard, make sure you like, rate, and subscribe. It really does make a massive difference. If you or anyone you know would like to share a story about driving with a disability, or you would like to get in contact, find the show notes, or find the resources mentioned in this episode, you can find us on Facebook. Just search at Drive Able Podcast for more information.